University of Washington and Wilkin Weiler from here in Toronto. Um, so I believe first John is going to go, and they're, they're both going to be talking about uh, how to use uh, MAVE data towards clinical uh, interpretation. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited to be talking to you all today uh, with Jochen on a topic that's very near and dear to us. Um, and so this is, you know, how to make your variant effect maps clinically useful. Um, the reason that we want to make these maps clinically useful is the problem that Doug introduced earlier. So if we look in ClinVar at the unique missense variants identified in clinical genetic testing, the majority of these are classified as variants of uncertain significance, so roughly 75 percent, as you can see on the left here. And this is a problem that's growing over time. The primary reason this is growing is we're just sequencing more genes and identifying more rare variation. And as we identify more rare variants, there's just less of a chance that there's going to be enough evidence to de definitively interpret these variants as pathogenic or benign. Um, but um, many of us in this room um, have been trying to address this problem by generating functional data at scale, because we can't do much about the rareness of these variants, but we can measure them all experimentally. Um, so once we generate a variant effect map, it's not immediately clear, though, how this data set will actually integrate into clinical um, genetic testing and, and variant interpretation. You know, ideally, what we'd like to do is take the functionally normal scores from our effect map and use those to interpret variants from clinical testing as benign, and then take the variants with um, functionally abnormal readouts and use those to interpret variants from clinical te testing as pathogenic. However, it's not quite as simple as Dr. Turnbull introduced um, yesterday. Um, making a clinical variant interpretation, you can't just take a score from a functional assay, you have to take information from um, many different uh, clinical areas. Um, so to introduce um, our workshop today, uh, Yoke and I are going to break this up into four main parts. The first will be a very brief introduction into clinical variant interpretation. In the second part, I'll talk about how we assign the strength of evidence to our functional assays. In the third part, I'll talk about some um, examples of where we did this with actual clinical variants, um, where we used uh, the multiplexed data to um, uh, reinterpret variants of uncertain significance. And then finally, Jochen will talk about some problem cases and some uh, proposed solutions as well as future directions for the use and interpretation of uh, multiplex data. So to introduce variant interpretation, I think it's just important to know what we mean when we actually bin a variant into one of these five categories. So if we're calling a variant benign on clinical testing, what we're actually saying about that variant is it has a less than 0.1% chance of being disease-causing. For likely benign, we loosen this to about uh, below 10%. On the opposite side of the spectrum, likely pathogenic variants have a 90 to 99% chance of being disease-causing, and pathogenic variants a greater than 99% chance. And then anything in between is a variant of uncertain significance. Um, but how do we actually get here? Um, so this is where we um, use that nice uh, rainbow table from the American College of Medical Genetics um, recommendations on variant interpretation to collect information from um, different areas and combine pieces of evidence. So these uh, pieces of evidence come from the patient's phenotype, segregation data of variants within families, population frequencies of our variant. Uh, computational predictive models and our functional assays. So uh, for a, a hypothetical variant, if you had information for all five of these pieces of evidence, you would then go to that lookup table from the original publication and see what is the strength that we can apply to these pieces of evidence. And it might look something like this, where you have five pieces of evidence towards uh, the interpretation of a variant as being pathogenic, uh, with a ranging strength of evidence from supporting to strong. You then look at another lookup table from that, that publication and say, how do we combine these together? Well, in this case, this would be a pathogenic variant. But this doesn't tell us much about what uh, supporting moderate or strong mean and how they relate to one another. Um, but fortunately, um, the ACMG actually came out with a Bayesian adaptation of these rules. Um, and here's a, a warning up front that there's going to be some equations on the next slides, um, but I promise you it's simple math. We'll go through it um, uh, together, and it, it'll be okay on the end. <laughs> so um, in order to, to you know, use this Bayesian adaptation, what we do is we just apply Bayes' rule. So we're actually now just calculating a posterior probability that our variant is pathogenic given the evidence. So what, the way that you'll see this expressed in a lot of the publications is actually transformed to accommodate, oh, there we go, to accommodate for odds. So now the posterior um, 
is written with this odds path uh, statistic. And what this odds path is, is just an odds ratio, uh, a way you can think of it, of all of your pieces of evidence combined together. But how do we actually calculate this? Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through the derivation of this odds path equation, um, but I'm showing it for a, a couple of reasons. First, to show that um, we now have a relation between strong supporting and moderate as um, exponentially scaled odds. Um, but also to show you that in order to calculate this, all we do is um, count up our pathogenic leaning pieces of evidence on the left and add those together, and then count up our benign leaning evidence on the right and subtract those out. And then we um, have a, an odds path that we can feed into the Bayesian equation. So the way that this would work for the hypothetical variant I introduced in the previous slide is we just count up our five pieces of evidence. So we have two supporting, two moderates, and one strong. Solve for the odds path, which is just over 1,500, and then plug this back into the equation where our prior is set to um, a probability of 0.1, which gives us a prior odds of 0.11, which is just the prior that was used to calibrate um, this Bayesian framework. And now we have a posterior probability of um, 0.994, which is greater than 99% chance, so this is a, a pathogenic variant. So now that we have this framework, we can actually calculate um, the odds path for any specific piece of evidence. Um, so I'll show you how we do this for functional data. And um, before I do that, I just want to point out that we can also set cutoffs for our strengths of evidence. Um, and the way that we do this is we just solve this equation for just a single piece of evidence of a given strength. So for example, for one piece of, path of very strong leaning pathogenic evidence, uh, we just solve for uh, one such piece of evidence, which is 350 to the first power, which is 350. So we have an odds path of 350. If we do this for every other evidence strength, uh, leaning pathogenic, we get odds paths of 18.7, 4.3, and 2.08. We could do the same thing for the benign leaning evidence and get odds paths that range from 0 0.003 to 0.48. And I point these out because these are going to be important cutoffs for us when we calculate the odds ratios um, and the odds paths for our assays. Uh, based on their ability to distinguish between established pathogenic and established benign variants. So we could sort of use this as a lookup um, to see what strength of evidence we achieve in our assays. Um, so to, to demonstrate how we would do this, um, I'm showing this hypothetical example of a pretty nice functional assay where we have 20 control variants, half of which are pathogenic in red and half of which are benign in blue. Function scores are, uh, as we typically represent them, on the x-axis, and this dashed line represents the cutoff between functionally abnormal variants on the left and functionally normal variants on the right. So in order to calculate the odds path, we just have to define what our posterior and our prior odds are uh, for, this, for this assay. And we do that um, by the proportion of pathogenic variants um, in our control set. So first we define the prior, which is just out of all of the control variants, um, we know half of them are pathogenic. So our prior probability is 0.5, which solves to prior odds of one. And then we calculate the posterior probabilities for each class, each functional class, for functionally abnormal, which would be the proportion of true pathogenic variants in the variants measured as functionally abnormal in the assay, which is nine over 10. And in the functionally normal side, we have one uh, true pathogenic variant out of the 10 functionally normal variants. Um, so now that we have uh, our posteriors and our prior odds, we can actually solve for the odds path for each functional class in our assay. So for the functionally abnormal class, this solves to nine, which is now a moderate strength of evidence for variance measured to be functionally abnormal in the assay. And then on the functionally normal side, um, we get an odds path of 0.11, which is also moderate strength of evidence this time for a benign interpretation for any variant in this assay that scores as functionally normal. Um, so given that, we actually applied this framework um, to variants from clinical genetic testing. Um, and the, the, the first example of this is the BRCA1 saturation genome editing data. Um, so again, we're, I'm showing you function scores from this assay plotted along the x-axis, and variants are now colored by their actual ClinVar classifications, where pathogenic are red and benign are blue. When we solve for the odds path for this assay, given it's extremely um, a strong validation with the clinical data, we get an odds path for the functionally abnormal variants of 52.4, which is strong evidence for uh, a pathogenic interpretation, and 0 0.02 for the functionally normal variants, which is also strong evidence for benign interpretation. When we applied this, uh, so first we, we collaborated with Ambry Genetics, who sent us their interpretations uh, for BRCA1 variants, and when we applied these uh, evidence strengths, 
to their interpretations of, of variants, we were actually able to reclassify 49% of the VUS in their data set to either likely pathogenic or likely benign. Um, we also did a similar analysis for TP53, but this was complicated by the fact that we had now four different um, assays. And if you look closely at these um, validation sets for the TP53 assays, none of them have the, the same level of um, um, separation between pathogenic and benign variants as the BRCA1 data. So individually, these assays don't get us strong evidence um, for variant interpretation. But we reason that because these assays are performed in two different cell lines and look at different um, functional, uh, different phenotypes for TP53, that we can combine them together uh, with a probabilistic classifier to come up with a unifying prediction of variant effect based on the scores across all four assays. So we used a naive base classifier, trained it on all of these control variants that I'm showing you on this slide, and performed leave one out cross-validation, where our classifier predicted that 39 of these variants would be functionally normal and 123 would be functionally abnormal. Uh, when we overlay the actual interpretations for these variants, we see that all 123 uh, functionally abnormal predictions um, were true pathogenic variants, and the seven variants that were misclassified were pathogenic variants that were predicted to be functionally normal. Um, so this gives us, uh, when we calculate our odds path, um, strong evidence for um, a pathogenic interpretation, um, for pathogenic interpretation for variants predicted to be um, functionally um, abnormal and moderate evidence uh, for a benign interpretation for variants predicted to be functionally normal uh, because we do slightly, uh, not quite as good at predicting those variants. Uh, we again applied these evidence codes to um, uh, AMBRI's variant interpretations and were able to reclassify a whopping 69% of the variants of uncertain significance, either likely pathogenic and likely benign. And these represent variants that, you know, uh, an updated sequencing report was then returned to the patients that had these um, initial VUS calls. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Jochen to talk about some problems and solutions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, now that we've seen a couple of straightforward examples of uh, how to take variant effect maps and turn them into evidence codes for classification, let's take a look at a couple more complicated on it, uh, problematic cases and see if we can find some solutions for them. Uh, the first problem that I wanted to talk about, what uh, happens if your gene of interest has a map that is sparse or that uh, has a lot of variants that have high measurement error? And uh, for that, I uh, wanted to point you at a tool that we, did, that we developed in the Roth lab, uh, which you can find at impute.variant-effect.org. And uh, this imputation tool allows us to infer missing variant effects and refine less confidently measured ones using machine, a machine learning approach. One important thing to mention about this, though, is that if we want to use these maps that we impute for variant classification, we need to still make sure that the provenance of the evidence that we generate or that, that we uh, use here is still uh, considerable as um, purely experimental. We don't want to cross our streams and introduce computational evidence uh, mixed in with, um, with experimental evidence. So we uh, uh, recently made an update to our imputation tool, which now added an option to uh, purely use uh, features that are intrinsic to the map itself um, in order to uh, make our imputation and refinement. Um, another, another problem that I wanted to talk about um, is uh, what happens if uh, your gene is particularly long and falls into multiple regions or multiple domains. And uh, you might notice that there are some stark differences in, in the behavior between those two domains. The map that I'm showing here is that of MTHFR. And uh, you may already see uh, in that small pictogram of the, uh, of the VE map itself that there are some uh, visible differences in the be behavior between the two domains, the catalytic domain and the regulatory domain that you see here. And uh, uh, if we look at the distribution of benchmark variants in there, and the red and green curves, we can see that in the catalytic domain, we get a much better separation of our pathogenic and benign benchmarks than we get in the, uh, in the benign half. So in this case, uh, it is relatively important that we treat those two domains separately and calculate, uh, calculate our odds path separately for those domains. Um, then, uh, yeah, uh, let's jump ahead to another problem. Um, in some genes, we might find that uh, dominant negative variants are uh, kind of the default mechanism of disease. And one uh, uh, example of this that I'm showing here is calmodulin. Uh, and a clear signature of this problem occurring 
would be visible in the distribution of those benchmark variants again. Uh, we can see here that pathogenic variants uh, only show a slight reduction in protein function, while null-like variants might actually still be benign. Uh, so rather than finding just a, sing a single threshold to uh, subdivide into our uh, pathogenic and benign zones, we might have to subdivide into three different zones uh, with the pathogenic ones in the center. Uh, you may also notice another problem with this uh, gene here, is, uh, uh, which would be that in the low end of the functional scores, uh, there are pretty much uh, almost no uh, be uh, benchmark variants available. So we see only a single benign variant in that low range of the functional score spectrum. Um, so uh, it seems that our thresholding approach is starting to really struggle here. But maybe, maybe there's a better solution. And that's what we're currently working on in, in the Roth lab, uh, is to see if we can find a method to calculate a dynamic odds path for individual variants uh, at individual positions of the score spectrum. And for that, we're uh, again using the distributions of pathogenic and benign benchmark variants. But now uh, we're trying to estimate the density of the two and uh, take a look at uh, their behavior. Here I'm showing in red, uh, the density of pathogenic variants, in green, uh, density of benign benchmark variants. And uh, if we look at the ratio between the two, it turns out that uh, that, is, uh, that corresponds to, uh, to the odds path itself. Uh, so uh, what we can do here is just uh, estimate the densities using kernel density estimation, take the ratio between the two, and we get an odds path for any given score on our spectrum. An example that I'm showing here uh, is uh, where we applied that uh, to that same BRCA1 map, and uh, we can see uh, the odds path, or rather the log of the odds path in the plot above, uh, and we can see in the high end of the spectrum, we dip into strong benign evidence. In the low end of the, uh, of the score range, we go into uh, strong pathogenic evidence, but you also see that there's a weird dip happening in that, in that range. Uh, which uh, happens due to a couple of outliers. And uh, if you're interested, if, or if I piqued your interest uh, with that, I encourage you to uh, come check out my poster on Thursday where we can talk about that in uh, more detail. Um, okay, um, let's uh, move on to the final problem that I wanted to uh, talk about, which is um, that uh, a problem that actually affects both of those approaches, both the thresholding approach that Sean talked about and that dynamic approach that we're currently working on, and that is that there's just too few benchmark variants out there to uh, uh, use these solutions for most of the uh, genes that we're interested in. Out of the 72 genes on the ACMG secondary findings list, only about 50, th or, or there, there are 53 that don't have enough benchmark variants to uh, make a usable assessment of current maps. And that kind of causes uh, a catch-22. On the one hand, we need more functional evidence to make uh, classifications, but also we need, on the other hand, more classifications that we can then use as benchmarks to make those, um, uh, those maps interpretable. Uh, so uh, one solution that we can use uh, for that, of course, is to uh, go into literature research and uh, try to find if there's variants out there that haven't been covered yet in ClinVar or we can uh, see if there's gene-specific databases out, out there. For example, for CBS, there's a really uh, nicely manually cu uh, curated gene-specific database of variants. And, um, uh, but uh, in many cases, that might just not work out. Uh, so uh, that brings me to my call to action. We really need more reference variants. So if you happen to make more classifications, please share them with the community. Uh, same thing goes with share all of your maps that you're generating. We have a beautiful database, MaveDB, out there, which uh, is uh, uh, setting its goal to collect all the data that we generate. Uh, please contribute to it. Um, and also uh, a call to please use standard, form uh, standard formats for this. Uh, try to use the HGVS standard to describe your variants and the MaveDB CSV format uh, to, uh, to submit your data. Um, OK. Uh, with that, uh, to summarize, um, we can use pathogenic and benign benchmark variants with Bayes' rule to determine ACMG evidence levels for, uh, for our variants. We can uh, use multiple maps together and combine them using B uh, naive Bayes classifiers. We can 
uh, use imputation to refine and uh, impute um, sparse maps or ones that are less confidently measured. Um, finally, it's uh, always useful to check if different regions or domains in your genes behave uh, differently from each other and need to be treated separately. Uh, then, and uh, finally, we need more benchmark variants, so um, please share your data. <laughs> uh, yeah, and finally, coming soon, a, a new method for uh, variant-specific odds path calculation in a dynamic fashion. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank everyone in the Roth lab and in the Fowler lab and uh, the Starita lab, uh, as well as, uh, yeah, uh, both our lab's uh, fund funding sources. And again, thank you for listening. Great workshop, thanks guys. So um, on the, the benchmark variant side of things, what do you think about the use of um, biobanks with linked health records to increase the numbers, especially of benign variants? Uh, yeah, I think that's probably a good idea to check out in the future and see if we can uh, use the massive amounts of data that are accumulating in those, uh, those biobanks to make more, uh, to infer more um, knowledge about what variants we can uh, use as additional benchmarks. Uh, same goes with, yeah, also nomad variants uh, helps a lot with uh, finding proxy benign variants that, uh, that can be used as benchmarks. And actually in the plot that I was showing earlier uh, for um, the number of benchmark variants available, I already included some of those nomad variants as proxy benign. Um, yeah, but yeah, great suggest suggestion. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. But. So there's been a lot of talk about interpreting hypomorphic variants. Is that something that you think your new odds path calculations will help with that as well? Um, well, in a sense, uh, one thing that it might, uh, uh, a problem that it might introduce is that as we go into the hypomorphic range and we get into the middle ground between the pathogenic distribution and the benign distribution, those hypom hypomorphs might uh, uh, not have uh, or might have odds path or log odds path that um, fall more into the uh, supporting range or sometimes even uh, range that can't be counted as evidence. So that's, uh, it all depends uh, if the uh, mechanism of disease for that particular gene is sensitive to those, uh, to those or hypomorphs at, in, the, uh, in the sense of protein function. But uh, if uh, those hypomorphs really um, are also visible in the uh, in the disease phenotype. Then hopefully that would also show up in the way that those pathogenic and benign distributions behave with respect to each other. Um, so what I'm really curious about is you know in the context of all these multiplexed assays that we're talking about, like how we can integrate these multiple different data sets, but especially in the case like in my proteins. Um, I, I can measure, sur I, I work with membrane proteins, I can work, measure surface expression very easily, but then function is really messy. Mm -hmm. And so like trying to define cutoffs based on function is difficult, but there are many cases where like it doesn't make it to the surface, but like how can we use both of these simultaneously when one is lower quality, but also that's the one you want? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Um I don't know if you want to talk about that first because that fall, falls uh, yeah. somewhat into your purview more than mine. But yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think that's a good question. Um, uh, essentially, asking about like multi-function proteins, um, and I think like the simple answer is you can calculate odds path on your readout and sort of see where you get, um, even if it's not capturing like everything the protein's doing, because um, you, you you still like depending on your benchmark variance, you know, you might get like a, a useful from the clinical side readout. Um, but then you might need to do something like combining um, some of your readouts together like we did for TP53. Um, 
Does that does that help answer the question? <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's also like thinking about it in terms of like having a really low quality data set for like the functional side, which reminded me when I saw those like really gappy data sets or whatnot, where it's like how do you use this higher quality data set to guide this lower quality data set when it comes to like calculating odds paths and things like that. Um, um, maybe another idea. Uh, uh, sorry. If you're no, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, maybe another idea. You could potentially extend this whole idea of uh, tracking the ratio between your pathogenic and benign uh, distributions in more than one dimension. You could have a multi-dimensional distribution of your uh, of your pathogenic and benign uh, variants over multiple uh, over multiple maps. But then you just exacerbate that problem of missing re reference variants because to support those multi-dimensional distributions, you need even more data. But yeah. Uh, interesting to think about. Okay, Thank you. It's a really great talk. So my question is more on the uh, uh, Johan your method, and I'm wondering basically because not only the number of variants matters here, it's also where those variants are on the distribution. Because if you have a lot of say pathogenic variants that have similar MAVE scores, then you won't be able to uh, separate. You know the distribution won't cover a lot of the other space that you don't have variants at. So I guess I, um, it'd be great if you can comment on like a, how many variants you think we need in order for the uh, uh, kernel density method to work, and B, do you think it matters like where those variants are and uh, you know, for us to guide the um, better interpretation, does it, uh, do we need the MAVE data to actually tell people we need the uh, reference variants on certain area where you know, the MAVE score might contribute the most? Uh, yeah, so I think in some respect that just depends on how well that separation between those uh, benchmark variants looks like. Um, so if, uh, if the separation isn't very good, then you probably need more data to get really um, a, a good estimate of that, of that density curve. Um, but if the separation is already good to begin with, maybe uh, fewer variants are necessary to, uh, to suss out the, the shapes of those distributions. Uh, I don't know if that answered all of your questions. You had, I think, multiple other <laughs> questions it's layered in there. Time. I think we can have this conversation yeah. okay. later. I think we should mm -hmm. end it there and, and thank all of our speakers. Uh,